We have some big solar flares, a solar storm glancing blow, and a launch that blew a coronal hole wide open. Those stories and more are in the news this week. Space weather this week has gotten interesting. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we had been anticipating region 4299 entering Earth view, and it did not disappoint. Well, at least initially. Back on the first, it fires a near X2 class flare. This is a gorgeous looking flare. In fact, it gave us a radio burst that was up into the gigahertz range and likely gave some uh, GPS and GNSS as well as satellite phones a little bit of a glitch before things quieted down. So early on, we really expected a lot from this region. As you can see, there's a, I caught it right here where you can see a bit of this big filament. Uh, it, it definitely involved several filaments. We've got this one here and there's another one here. As a matter of fact, let me take this whole scene and turn it on its side because when you look at it that way, you can see a lot more. So here's that region here. Here's the cluster of big regions down below it. So this is the northern part of the sun and that points to the south. But why I did it this way is because you can see this filament. You can almost see like a little bit of a valley in here where this kind of river of plasma is staying. And when this, this thing lights off. It begins to light off the filament. Then you'll see this whole thing go. And you'll also see it take up another filament right in here. Watch this thing go right here. Lights this up. There's the big X-class flare. And now it lights up this other filament region. And yet, despite all that activity with that X2 flare and all of these, this very complicated mess going out, the filament that lit off partly fills back in very quickly. See that? We've got still a ton of material in this little river valley here, as well as more like an empty channel here that begins to fill up. So these do two valleys here are not done. They're likely going to continue to give us at least partial eruptions. In fact, you can watch yet another one right there. See that? So these fil this filament area is still kind of connected with all of this magnetic field in a very tight curve, which it's really not super stable. So we're going to be watching this region, even though region 4299 is kind of calmed down a little bit. In fact, as we take a closer look at it, here is where it was just beginning to rotate into Earth view. So it's kind of fuzzy when we take a look at it in our magnetic imagery. And as you can see, you don't want the blue and the red to be close together. I actually have a little bit of white in here from, this is actually the uh, umbra and then the penumbra for those who care. Uh, showing how tightly this red was into this penumbra of the, this blue region. And you can watch this thing with after this X, uh, X flare just dissipate into nothing. Look at that. It just almost disappears into nothing. So this region very, very quickly kind of quieted down after that big flare. So I'm not sure it's going to give us all that much. But then as we take a look at the other set, now this is the set of really big regions, right? 4296, 4294, and 4298. They look like they might be giving us a little bit of something early on, but really over time, all they've done is just kind of spread out and be a bit on the quiet side. So they're right now extremely well behaved. We do have a couple filaments that, uh, like core filaments that are uh, connecting these, these regions together. And we'll talk more about them later. I'm kind of a little bit concerned if they launch, they could be really big earth directed solar storms. But overall, this set of regions is acting quite quietly. So despite all the brightness on this side of the, of the limb, really, the big region that's been kind of taking center stage since about the first has now been this region, which is region 4300. In fact, if you recall back last week when I was talking about the Mars observations of the sun, we had this one region that kind of popped up out of the middle of nowhere between two, two different days. And sure enough, that was this region here. So this is the youngest region of the cluster, and it fires off a big M-class flare. We'll take a look at that in just a second. But before that, we talk, let's talk a little bit about this coronal hole. If you notice, this is the coronal hole that's been giving us some fast solar wind over the last day or so. It popped us up to G3 levels eh, momentarily. It really wasn't. If you're at high latitudes and an aurora photographer, you probably got a decent show for a very short bit. But overall, this uh, the fast wind from this coronal hole has been underwhelming. And that's likely because this coronal hole has actually shrank a bit compared to where we saw it last, uh, last rotation. But we'll talk more about the size of this thing because it's actually changing quite dramatically. We also have a little bit of a coronal hole here that 
Well, when it plays really close to big regions like this, this could be a very active uh, area. So we're going to be paying close attention to that as well as the um, active regions building in this area too. But what we really want to talk about is this gorgeous filament in here that launched just the other day. This filament along with region 4288 all fired all at once and you'll see it right here. Boof, right there. It's kind of hard to watch it come off, but you can see the light ribbons here on either side of that filament. It's a much bigger view from stereo's view and we'll show it a little bit later. But believe it or not, it, it evacuated a ton of material. And as we take a look at it in coronagraphs, you can see the coronagraph view, not just in the raw images. Look at the difference images. Boy, this is really dense. So you kind of go, wow, that was just a filament eruption. Shouldn't it be coming further south? No, it's coming up north, and we'll talk about why in just a second. It was actually a very large eruption and involved a lot more than what it might originally look like. But this one is going to be heading off to stereo. It's not going to hit us, but hey, look at this. You see this big pow? I kind of stopped it in the middle. This is that M6 class flare that, that region 4300 put out. This, this is actually going to go to the east of Earth, but it did trigger another one. Look, do you see this right here? This kind of dimming in this region here. This one is actually a, a solar storm launch that is actually could give us a glancing blow. As we look in coronagraphs, you can see that puff. That's from region 4300 going off to the east. But then just shortly thereafter, look at this. Here's that later one, poof, like this. It's actually quite extensive between the two of them. So this might give us a little bit of something here at Earth. It's kind of hard to tell, but that's going to be around the 7th and possibly the 8th. We'll talk more about that. Uh, as we get into the five day. But meanwhile, expect a little bit more activity from region 4300. It probably is going to take center stage. Expect the filaments in and around region 4299 that they could actually launch yet again. And then we'll also talk about the core filaments here in just a second. But before I do that, I'm going to wipe all the numbers off the, the uh, sun because I want you to see this massive a change to this coronal hole from this eruption that we just had. So look at the coronal hole. It's a nice little triangle right here. And here is the filament that we had in question. Okay, it's kind of buried, a little hard to see. This is region 4288. Watch the whole thing kind of light up here in just a sec right there. Okay. So region 4288 fires its, its big storm region or this region here with this filament lifts this filament off. But do you see the boundary of that coronal hole? Watch this whole lip right here. Watch it just disappear. Whoosh. You see that? Look how massive this coronal hole is. This whole edge is now big, right? It's all dark. So now this coronal hole has grown back to, well, maybe the size it was prior rotation. So next time this region rotates into Earth view, which will be about a month from now, all you Aurora photographers who were really hoping this was going to give us a bigger show, well, if this coronal hole stays as wide as it has now, it might give us that big show again because it'll be a, a lot larger, have much better fast solar wind, and could give, give Earth a, a bit longer period of time for, um, you know, for Aurora shows. So we'll, we'll keep on top of that. Meanwhile, here's region 4300 right there. Fires off that stuff. You can see the, a little bit of the dimming there. But what I really wanted to show you are these core filaments. You can see a little bit of a core filament right here at the tailing edge of region 4299. And then also this big filament right here. These are the core filaments I'm a bit concerned about. I'm going to keep an eye on them. Right now they look really stable and these regions are reasonably quiescent. So let's hope they stay that way because when these core filaments go, they're very dense. We don't really want them launching toward Earth um, because those will create really big storms. But outside of that, it's been an interesting week. Uh, and we'll talk more about some of the regions that are going to be coming into the, the um, into Earth view from the far side. But overall, I think Things are going to quiet down after this. And now taking a look at our sun from Stereo's view, and Stereo is sitting off to the west of Earth. It's nice that we can see a little bit of the far side from Stereo, but what's really cool is that we can also get a nice view of that big filament launch. In fact, as I orient us here, you can see here's that big coronal hole, and here is that filament. Much easier to see in Stereo's view than it was back at Earth because we're kind of looking at it edge on. Here's also region 4288 that we're going to be paying attention to very closely. So as these regions rotate more into view, you can see these, these new regions that kind of came up really caused that filament to launch. I'll back it up just a little bit because we have a few frames that got dropped. But 
you can see region 4288, it all kind of was connected. These regions coming up, they loosened this and this thing goes and then region 4288 pops as well. So boom, right there. We're going to get a nice view of that one straight at stereo. It is a full halo in stereo's view in the coronagraphs. So we'll get a nice idea of what kind of structure this is going to be and what it would have done if it had hit Earth because this could have been a very big solar storm had it hit Earth. You can also see how incredibly wide that coronal hole is now. So that's one really nice uh, thing about stereo A is that it's going to also get that fast solar wind and that'll give us a nice kind of sneak peek as to what we're going to see about a month from now. And now switching to our full sun map, we are not using a uh, solar orbiter data because solar orbiter is still on the front side of the sun. So all we're going to use with our full sun map this time is just uh, SDO AIA imagery and the JSOC HMI helioseismology farsighted viewer to kind of complete the picture. And to get you oriented, you can watch as region uh, 4294. You can also watch region 4299 pop in here. And this set of regions, right, this is still on the east limbs you can kind of see where that coronal hole is right there now region 4288 we are going to definitely be watching this region on the sun's far side because it does still seem to be firing big um, big solar st storms and big solar flares but as we look past the uh, east limb onto the sun's far side we really don't see a lot in the way of active regions this these old uh, clusters of regions have been pretty quiet the only real activity we're seeing is from region 4284 and 4283 and maybe a new region just north of it but it does look like we're seeing a bit more in terms of what they're doing here both here and here not super strong regions per se but they could give us a little bit of flare activity once they rotate back into earth view in about three to four days and now returning to that solar storm that's going to give us a bit of a glancing blow we are take a look at our solar storm prediction model Enlil now this is NASA's version of the model and you're looking down at the Sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right and as I set this solar storm model in motion you can see this very small solar storm and it's not it's definitely going to go east of Earth but it is in us what we call a stream interaction region which means it could get enhanced a little bit and it kind of allows it to have a bit much a bit of a further reach so Aurora photography if you're at high latitudes in and around the 7th and the 8th you could get a little bit of a show but likely for the rest of it it's just going to be a bit of a bumpy ride so only if you're dedicated should you chase it might be better to go out and just look for those geminids because we're getting close to the height of the geminid meteor shower now switching to our moon we are passing through the full moon phase now on our way to a third quarter and by the 11th the moon will still be about 54 percent illuminated so you night sky watchers if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky like maybe some aurora or that geminid meteor shower that's going to be peaking on the 13th and 14th well you're going to have this bright companion so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times and now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week at high latitudes we are continuing to get that fast solar wind that could give us a bit of an aurora show NOAA is expecting minor storm conditions with up to about a 55 percent chance of a major storm over the next day or so things will calm down a little bit and then as we get into the seventh and the eighth well that's when we're going to get that glancing solar storm blow it's kind of hard to tell how much of an impact it's going to have so i've kind of left it tentative here expect possibly minor storm conditions here with maybe about a 65 percent chance of a major storm but that's just over those days when that, not expecting it to last all that long but it could give us a little bit of something and then things will start calming down right around Tuesday now as we switch to mid latitudes well we are dealing with that fast solar wind right now but we're only expecting about a 35 percent chance of active conditions likely things are just going to remain a bit unsettled it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride right around the 7th or the 8th it's kind of hard to tell exactly when that impact that impact from that stream interaction region and that fast and that solar storm is going to hit so in and around this time we could bump up to active conditions again not expecting all that much so only if you're dedicated should you chase if you're going to be chasing at mid latitudes 
Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well into the 200s for solar flux, and this does mean severe noise on the dayside radio bands because of all of those big active regions that are actively flaring right now. NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and also about a 25% chance of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout, and I'm going to extend that easily throughout those five day because it's really hard to tell, especially with region 4300, whether or not it's going to end up being a really big X flare player. So and if you're a ham radio operator or if you do emergency response on the day side radio bands, especially in HF and VHF, just expect that conditions are going to be noisy over the rest of this week and things will begin to calm down slowly after that. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Right now, everything is in the green when it comes to radiation storms. We are at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. Where we are not in the green is in our risk factor. NOAA right now is giving us about a 15% chance of S1 to S2 level radiation storms over the next three days. I've extended that to the end of the week. It could go up as it, it depends upon how much these uh, active regions continue to flare. If they continue to be big flare players, then yes, expect that radiation storm risk to rise. But right now, it looks like things are just going to kind of hold where we are. So you aviators, and this does include flight crew and you high-risk passengers, we're all in the green right now, but pay attention to those ICAO advisories and be, be ready to change your flight plans if necessary. So the space weather this week has gotten quite interesting. We do have some big flare players in Earth view. Some of them have been giving us big X-class flares and M-class flares, and likely this is going to continue uh, off and on sporadically over the next few days, possibly the rest of this week before things calm down. We do not have any big uh, solar storms headed toward Earth. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you might be enjoying some fast solar wind and maybe a bit of a bumpy ride from a solar storm glare dancing blow, but aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, you're just going to kind of need to kind of wait it out and see if we get a big solar storm launch that's Earth-directed. But right now, things are pretty calm. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we have those big flares on Earth's day side, and some of them have been popping up at levels with radio bursts that are above one gigahertz. So you could be seeing a little bit of glitching out and some, you know, lost signals, uh, especially near the day side and especially near dawn and dusk. So be sure to stay vigilant, but at least on the night side, as long as you stay away from Aurora, your GPS reception should be pretty top-notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.